They actually are more than a century older than the museum itself. The Smithsonian began collecting stamps in 1886. Um, they, the Smithsonian sort of stumbled into stamp collecting, um, as I called it in, uh, in an exhibit I did for the 125th anniversary a couple of years ago. Um, that is, they began collecting stamps as relics, historical relics in the 1880s. And so when they collected, for example, the first philatelic item that came into the museum's collection was um, a, a pane of 100 of the um, uh, five cent Jefferson Davis stamps of the Confederacy. They weren't collecting them as philatelic items. They weren't intending to set about building a philatelic collection. Instead, they collected them and displayed them as Civil War relics along with captured battle flags and, and uh, instruments used in the field and, and weapons and that sort of thing. Uh, but over time, they, they started to acquire a, a goodly enough number of these things that, that they realized whether they, whether they had intended to create it or not, what they had done was create a philatelic collection. Uh, and it's grown since then. Today, the National Philatelic Collection is the largest, um, most comprehensive philatelic collection in the world, about six million objects. Um, in the National Philatelic Collection. And it's, it's the oldest intact national collection of philately in the world. Um, and really, two of the Postal Museum's major responsibilities center around this collection. That is, number one, caring for it, um, but also providing public access to it. And we, we do the public access bit in a number of ways. Through our websites, of course, through coming to shows like this and giving talks, occasionally uh, bringing material out uh, original material out for exhibition at shows like this. That's a way we, we provide access to the collection through outreach. But then also our on-site facility at the museum, our own exhibit galleries, are a way that we provide the public access to the collection. And we're going to start doing that in an even bigger way um, than we have been up until now in September when we open the William H. Groves Stamp Gallery. The gallery was created with a $10 million leadership gift from William H. Groves who uh, a number of you will know as a, as a businessman and a philanthropist, but also a philatelist. Um, the gallery opens in September of 2013, and when it opens um, at uh, about 12,000 square feet, it'll be the largest gallery dedicated solely to philately in the world. And the, some of the material that I'm gonna talk about today, um, the gallery is really six or seven galleries within uh, the overall William H. Gross Gallery. And one of them, one of those six or seven uh, galleries that make up the larger gallery is called the National Stamp Salon. And the material I'm gonna show you some of uh, this morning will actually be on display in the National Stamp Salon, where we'll have over 400 pullout frames. Now, if you've been to the Postal Museum, um, you will be pleased to know that we are not using the pullout frames that are in the gallery now. Uh, what, what we've discovered is that, is that they are carnivorous. Um, and, and they are satisfied only by periodic offerings of the blood of staff and visitors. Uh, they're, they're, you know, it's easy to get your fingers caught in those frames. They're, they're sort of clunky and that sort of thing. Um, and so we actually have commissioned and having designed, and I've been told they, they arrived on a ship uh, to, uh, to Norfolk last week, uh, our new uh, 400, I believe we ordered 400 pullout frames. Um, that, were, uh, that, that have been specially manufactured newly for this gallery. And about 300 or, or so of those frames will contain a permanent exhibition of what we call the National Stamp Collection. And this is, five, over the course of the last five or six years, the curators and outside consultants and experts um, have come in, and what we've done is select out of those six million objects that I told you about, we've selected approximately 4,000 pieces that we feel represent the best material in the museum's collection from the first century of U.S. philately, from 1847 to 1947. And that will be a permanent exhibition on one side of the National Stamp Salon. And then on the other side of the National Stamp Salon, we've reserved or dedicated some more of those pullout frames to other exhibitions of specialized collections. Uh, and some <coughs> of these will change a little more often. The National Stamp Collection we view as, as being permanent. Um, and so some of the things that will be shown in the specialized collection area are, for example, Revenues, Hawaii. Uh, we'll have uh, a selection from the Benjamin K. Miller collection of the New York Public Library, which is now on, on permanent loan to the National Postal Museum, will be on view there. Changing selections from the Postmaster General's collection of the United States Postal Service, which is also on, on permanent loan to the National Postal Museum, will be shown in this gallery as well. And then if you look really, really hard in a corner, you'll find three or four 
of these frames that are dedicated to a topic that a number of people find very fascinating, and that's fakes, forgeries, and fantasies. Uh, and so what I wanted to do this morning to have a little fun on Sunday uh, is, uh, is take a look at this, this little exhibit, which will only be two or three of the pullout frames in the National Stamp Collection, but has what I think is some really neat stuff. And this is, this is material that interests um, the general public who comes to the museum, too. More than half of our visitors are not stamp collectors. Uh, we know this from uh, what, what we call front-end surveys of visitors coming into the museum. Uh, many of these non-collectors who come to the museum are accompanying family members who are collectors, um, but many of them also are not. They've come to the museum for other reasons. They've come either to see the building, or they've come because they're in Washington for a week and they've run out of things to do, uh, or they've heard we have several planes hanging from the atrium, or they want to see the truck or the stagecoach. They're not really interested in the stamps, but once they get into the museum, uh, having, uh, having things like this on display is a way that they go. You know, this is a significant part of the collection, too. Let me go take a look at this, and maybe I'll become interested in this as well. So, Fakes, Forgeries, and Fantasies are one of those exhibits that I think, uh, if we promote it the right way, has, uh, has the potential to be very interesting to non-collectors as well, and sort of bring them into the gallery, and then they start pulling out all the other frames and looking at what else is in there. So, we start with Postal Counterfeits. Um, and, uh, really, we, we'll have more than a century's worth of Postal Counterfeits on display in these frames, including one of the earliest known, the 1895 Chicago counterfeit, uh, which was discovered uh, because of advertisements in Chicago area newspapers uh, advertising enormous quantities of discount postage, uh, which caught the attention of the postal inspectors uh, who uh, investigated uh, where these ads were coming from. And there was actually a, a connection to a firm in Canada. And so we're really lucky that there are lots of, um, lots of, there are a number of mint copies of the stamp on cover, but very few, uh, or rather mint copies of the stamp, but very few on cover. And the fact that ours is on cover um, to a Canadian concern is particularly interesting because it, it, there was a Canadian business involved in this, in this counterfeiting scheme. Um, and so uh, one of the 1895 Chicago counterfeits on cover, right down to one of the more recent um, counterfeits on cover, the 25 cent Jack London's, uh, if you want to see a real one of these uh, up on the floor of any of these postal counterfeits, uh, John Hotchner has a number of them in his collection as well. Uh, so uh, these are the examples from the museum's collection that will be on display in the gallery. But if you just can't wait until September to see what they look like in the flesh, you can see some of them upstairs. Yeah? Cancellation is good or not good? Uh, no, the cancellation is, is good. It went through the mail. Uh, but the stamp itself is the counterfeit. Um, and the, the Jack London counterfeit is, uh, is kind of an interesting one about which not too much is known. Uh, the 25 cent Jack London really didn't have too much of a postal use when it was issued um, in 1986. And then two years later in 88, when the postal rate went up to 25 cents, suddenly it became a very useful stamp uh, and it became the target of, of counterfeiters. Um, these counterfeits are lithographed. Uh, I, I've never seen any figures or anything approaching a census as to how many of them are known, but it seems to be very few. Uh, this particular one, although I've sort of cropped it out ge uh, graphically to fit it on the slide, this is addressed to the Internal Revenue Service. <laughs> 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 and then marked return to sender. So not only did we not want to pay our taxes, probably, we didn't want to pay the postage either. <laughs> The 1949 presidential lithographs are fairly well known. The Postal Museum has a, a full pane of 100 of these. Uh, part of the streamlining of stamp design during the FDR era was towards um, cleaner, more simple designs without a lot of the ornate typography and frames and fonts and vignettes and all that sort of stuff. Clean, simple designs um, that, were, uh, that were streamlined, reflecting the design ethic of the 1930s. But, Part of the reason for all of those frilly doodads and ornate frames and typography all around the outside of the earlier stamps was that those things are very difficult to counterfeit. Uh, but suddenly, when, you're, when you reduce stamp design to its very elemental characteristics, as they did with the presidential series, this becomes pretty easy for anybody with a decent printing press, uh, access to a lithograph press, um, uh, to make very convincing, very good-looking forgeries of these stamps. And that's exactly what happened with the three cents. Uh, three cent Jefferson. The Rhode Island counterfeits, 
the Chicago counterfeits, the Rhode Island counterfeits. A lot of these counterfeits are named after towns, cities, places. Usually they're named after the place where they were first discovered in the, in the mail street. That's not necessarily the place where they were created. Um, but, uh, and the Rhode Island counterfeits are an example of that. Uh, they seem to have been created by organized crime in New York, but they're called the Rhode Island uh, Kennedy counterfeits because they surfaced in the Providence, Rhode Island uh, sectional uh, sorting facility when uh, the uh, automatic facing and canceling machines kicked them out because they didn't have luminescent tagging. Um, and so it was discovered that a number of these counterfeits existed. So, so as you look through examples of the 13 cent Kennedy on cover, um, you want to look for the Rhode Island counterfeit, and they're pretty easy uh, to spot once you know what you're looking for. And you're looking right over the C in the 13. There's a strange little hyphen or mark. It's a, it's a consistent flaw right over the C in the 13. So keep your eye out. Now go up and look for, ask all the dealers if they've got 13 cent Kennedys on cover. And look for the, <laughs> look for the counterfeit. Okay. So postal counterfeits, which we've just seen, are, are counterfeits that are created for the purpose of depriving the Postal Service of its revenue for carrying the mail. Fakes are, are a slightly different matter. Fakes are created for collectors. Um, and a fake, um, it, it, what makes something a fake rather than a forgery? A fake is something that starts out life in, its some, in a genuine form and then has been altered or changed in some way to make it more desirable as opposed to a forgery. A forgery is uh, something that's created entirely out of whole cloth. It was never genuine to begin with. So as we look through some examples, you'll, you'll see what that means. So uh, a famous case are the RF overprints um, that were used for the free French naval forces in World War II. The underlying stamps here and the six cent postal stationery here are genuine. Um, these are as they were printed and issued by the Bureau of Engraving and Printing in the case of the stationery, the government printing office. But then uh, a faker has added some characteristics to take these otherwise very common and cheap pieces of, of stamped paper and, and postal stationery and try and make them appear more desirable to collectors. Um, so during the Second World War, uh, the United States extended to the, uh, to the sailors in the Free French Navy uh, the privilege of using the US mail system to get their, their correspondence into the mail stream. And uh, RF overprints uh, for the French Republic uh, were used on these stamps. Um, and, and examples of them are, are kind of uncommon. Um, and when people, particularly since this, this transport series is very popular among collectors, uh, there's, there's a market for them out there. And right after World War II, there was a market for them too. A lot of people didn't know these things had been created um, until just as the war ended. And so there was a rush on the part of fakers before a lot of information came out about these overprints and where and how they were used and what they all looked like, hurry up and get some out on the market before people, before people start to be able to tell the good ones from the bad ones. So these um, uh, fakes uh, appeared right after the end of the war, or right at the end of the war in 45 and 46. But we know now that they're fakes because uh, two main things. One, these were formats of stamps that were never <coughs> issued to the Free French Naval Forces. The booklet paintings and the postal stationery were never used by the Free French. Only the, the sheets of 50, um, uh, full panes of 50. Uh, so these formats shouldn't exist at all with RF overprints. And then this uh, very sort of frilly script type of overprint um, is also not known on any of the genuine covers. Uh, this RF overprint here is somewhat closer uh, to the types, one of the genuine types of overprints, but this is a, is a total fantasy. Uh, and then even on some of the covers, uh, there are a number of things. So all of these lovely typewritten covers with RF overprints on them, um, there were no typewriters aboard the free friendships. Uh, every a genuine known example of the usages of these stamps on cover are handwritten. And also, many of these covers uh, that, that are suspect have the same suspect overprint, um, are typed up, and, but also they don't have the sort of censorship markings that one would expect. Uh, from, uh, from mail originating aboard a, the, a free French uh, naval vessel. So here's an example now where the stamp is genuine, the cover is genuine, uh, you know, the, the cachet, I suppose, is, is genuine. Um, but what's at issue here is the cancellation. 
And these first state covers were created by a dealer in the 60s and 70s who was confronting a problem that confronts a lot of first state uh, cover servicers, cachet makers, etc., which is, you know, you never know which issues are going to be popular and which issues aren't going to be popular. And you sink a lot of money into these cachets and you sink a lot of money into the postage to create these covers. And sometimes you end up carrying stocks of these covers for years and years and years and you can't move them. Wouldn't it be much more convenient if you could just cancel these things to order as people request them? Um, well, yeah, but there are limits as to how long you can get the first day cancellation for, right? What if an order comes in 60 days, 90 days, 120 days later? Well, it's really easy if you just make up your own hand stamp cancellation devices. These are just rubber stamps. Uh, any decently equipped print shop can make them. Um, and then you don't have all this money tied up in covers that might prove to be unpopular and all that good postage that's now, now wasted. No, no, better just to make up these covers as people request them and keep a, keep a stock of the first day cancels. So you can see, um, uh, well, it's kind of hard because uh, this, the projector's being temperamental, but this mimics a uh, machine cancel, a first day four bar machine cancellation, but it's actually created um, by a rubber stamp. And the whole story of these, of these fakes, uh, uh, when they finally uh, were recognized as fakes in the early mid-80s, were all written up in first days. Um, you can go back and, and look up the story of the cachet maker and, uh, and where they came from. But, um, so, this, so you see the trend here is where you take underlying stamps or covers that are real and in some way enhance them to increase their value to collectors. That's a fake, and we have a number of examples of these in, uh, in, in, the, in the gross gallery. And then the forgeries. So the forgeries were never genuine in any respect. They started out life uh, as, uh, uh, as suspect items, and, and, and they, always, they always were uh, created for the collector market. They never had any, any genuine uh, part of their past. And one of the great forgers uh, of stamps generally, but including early US, uh, was the master forger Jean Disparati, uh, who practiced his craft from 1909 uh, into the 1940s, and uh, the way it was discovered uh, that he was a, f a counterfeiter or a forger uh, of rare and valuable stamps was that he was arrested uh, in France for exporting valuable stamps from the country without a license uh, and placed on trial. And as part of his defense then, uh, he brought forth that, well, actually I'm not exporting anything valuable at all. I've created all of these. Uh, and so that's how his forging, his forging activities came to light as part of his defense in his trial for exporting all these royal stamps, or, or valuable stamps without a, a license um, from France. And uh, he didn't do too many U.S. stamps, but one of the ones that he did and did really well is the 10 cent Washington. And who would not go upstairs and buy this if you found it at a table. What a lovely, beautiful copy with a nice blue cancel, perfectly uh, struck, and, but not obscuring the design. Oh, what a, what a beautiful piece and totally fake. Um, and, and the way, uh, the easiest way, if you have a glass, to be able to tell this variety of forgeries is that unlike the engraved originals, um, these will be lithographed, but you really have to have a pretty high power uh, glass to see that that's the case. And also, um, the Sparati uh, forgeries are missing the um, down here the initials of the printer the rod and right hatch and mints and initials um, they're missing those at the bottom so an original Sparati forgery of, uh, of the 1847 US will be on view and here's where we get start to get into the fun stuff and some of the really colorful characters from the early days of philately one of whom was George Hussey George Hussey was operated a local post in New York City in the early days of philately and stamp collecting in the 1860s thereabouts. And what Hussey realized was that a number of people, his customers who were coming in to use his local post, were not really interested so much in his local post, but they were these, they were these stamp collecting people. And they were interested not only in his stamps, but the stamps of the other local post companies that were operating in New York and, and constantly asking Hussey if he had any of them on hand. And he kept having to tell them, no, he didn't have any of them on hand. Well, you're, you're turning a lot of business away. And so wouldn't it be much better to get a, to, to get a printer um, and pay him to print up these stamps so that when people come in and you've got all these collectors looking to buy your stamps and examples of your, your, your colleagues in business as well, you, yes, you have a full stock of them and you can make money. <coughs> and and uh, so Hussey did quite a lot of this. Um, 
Hussey even, seems strange to say, but Hussey even forged his own stamps. Um, so some of his early issues that he had produced and, and used in his local post business that he no longer had any quantity of on hand when collectors came in looking for them, he went and found the printer who had printed them up for the first place, in the first place, and gotten quantities of them reprinted and all that sort of thing. So he forged his own stamps, but then he got the printing plates uh, from some of his other dealers or other uh, local post owners in New York City had their stamps printed up, and if he couldn't get his hands on the plates, he would advertise in the New York new newspapers. You know, if you have plates for any of these stamps, you know, he'll buy them. And if he couldn't buy them, then his printer, a guy named Thomas Wood, was only too happy to recreate them uh, and make them up for him. The story of, I've told you the story of how Sparati's activities were uncovered. The story of how Hussey's activities were uncovered is similarly sort of interesting. There was a very short-lived local post in New York, it's unclear whether it ever even carried any actual mail, called the Essex Letter Express. And you see the stamp issued by the Essex Letter Express down here. And a number of philatelists, some of them fellow dealers, uh, were, knew that somebody in New York was producing these forgeries uh, of early local post stamps and were determined to try and find out who it was. And so you see there's a space below the water uh, between the water and the bottom of the oval in the Essex Letter Express stamp. And so they got together and uh, put different, we call them like check letters, um, in the space underneath the water. And one of them, they put the letters SX uh, as a sort of a contraction for Essex. And they made up several of these with different letters, passed them out to all the suspects, <laughs> and waited for the forgeries to appear and see which set of letters it was that would show up on the market. Uh, and, and suddenly there were enormous quantities of the SX um, in the space below the water, and they knew that was, that was the example they had passed to Hussey. Uh, and so that was who was creating the, <laughs> creating the same. <laughs> it was kind of a covert operation, not, not, by, not by philatelists looking to, to protect the integrity of, of collecting in the early days. No, no, not at all. Uh, mostly this was done by um, other dealers who were also counterfeiting this stuff. Uh, and wanted to find out who their competition was. I mean, that was really what was sort of going on in this period. This whole field of U.S. carriers and locals was so shot through, so riddled with these forgeries by, by as early as the 1880s, that I'd say only in the last 20 years really has it become a popular collecting area again. People stayed away from it for over a century because it was just so riddled with this stuff. J.W. Scott, the great and venerable J.W. Scott, father of philately in America, was also one of uh, America's most prolific forgers. And um, Scott's problem was a little bit different. Uh, Scott produced albums, as we know. Uh, and the problem he had were all of the purchasers of his albums were, would eventually contact him, upset at the fact that he had spaces for all these stamps in, their al in his albums that they couldn't fill. Um, and so he decided to supply the need. <laughs> and so, we get, so we get Scott, uh, Scott forgeries designed to sell to the customers of his albums who are frustrated with him because there are empty spaces in their albums. So the, and, and several famous uh, earlier, early carriers, locals, uh, semi-official type things. Here's the Bloods, here's the Washington City Dispatch, uh, et cetera. It, interesting thing, one of the reasons that carriers and locals attracted so much forgery activity in this period was that uh, it was generally believed by the forgers that because they weren't official U.S. stamps, Treasury wouldn't get involved and um, the postal inspectors wouldn't get involved. They wouldn't care because these weren't officially. And, and they, they were generally right about that. So they stuck to carriers, locals, Confederates, private express stamps, that sort of thing. One or two of the forgers <coughs> strayed into the field of actual official carrier stamps, um, but, but uh, not too many. And they, they did generally studiously avoid actual U.S. postage stamps. Most of the forgeries of U.S. postage stamps from this era come from overseas. Henry K. Jarrett um, was uh, a forger who was active in the 1920s and 30s. And, um, he specialized in postmaster provisionals, another field that uh, most forgers believed the government wouldn't be interested in, uh, wouldn't prosecute people who, who were involved in these forgeries. In this case, uh, it turned out to be wrong. Uh, but um, 
Jared didn't just forge any old stamps. Um, he forged things like the Annapolis Postmaster Provision. Um, he forged <laughs> he forged some pretty uh, pretty recognizable pieces, and one little section of this exhibit will kind of show the anatomy of a forgery is how I called it when I was writing it up in the exhibit. So what he would do is when he decided, for example, he was going to create a five cent Annapolis local, he'd find an appropriate cover from the period um, so that the addressee is real. If anybody did historical research on who the cover was addressed to, they'd find it was a real person who really lived at this address in the, or at this post office in this period. So he, he, there's a real attention to detail there. So often he would try and buy these letters, particularly if they had their original contents. And then he would copy the address from the original cover onto his forgery and take the original letter and put it inside too. So you see, this is a letter from Annapolis in the period <coughs> that the postmaster provisional stamp was used and addressed to somebody who really had a connection to family or business interests in Annapolis. So, so from that point of view, they were excellently done forgeries. But um, you see up here, D14, D7, these are people's evidence numbers <laughs> uh, that, that, are, that are on the, uh, uh, what, what happened was when he started going after some of the really big things, like the Annapolis Postmaster Provisional and the Alexandria Postmaster Provisional. Um, these are things that have such a pedigree um, that the appearance of a brand new one causes a great deal of skepticism. And, and when he tried to sell some of these to, who was it now? I'm trying to remember. Not Worthington, but somebody like a George Worthington or a really well-known collector. Was it Kaspari? might have been Kaspari he tried to sell some of these things to. Um, uh, Kaspari sort of turned the stuff over to the police and said, this, this, is, this is not right, this isn't. And so he was not really uh, arrested and tried for actually forging the stamps, which he claimed were artistic creations and this sort of thing. It, but it was mail fraud because he had, uh, he had approached these sellers through the mail by sending them pictures. Mm -hmm. uh, and so actually the crime here was not actually forging the stamps, but it was it was mail fraud. And so you can see some of the other pieces from uh, Jared's collection. Here's the New Haven Postmaster Provisional. Here's a, a Postmaster Provisional uh, that never existed, or at least has never been recorded from uh, Utica, New York. But here's, here's a whole long history of it, how many copies of each are known. Uh, pure baloney. But there it all is on, on his stock sheets. Um, some color trials here, Carmen Red. Uh, fives, you know, getting getting the, the pressure and the quantity of ink, making making that five look just right. Um, it's another Jarrett forgery. And so after the case was over, uh, all this material uh, was was uh, case filed. The government didn't quite know what to do with it, uh, and so they gave it to the Smithsonian. And then the last um, category of material we're showing in this exhibit is fantasies, and a number of these fantasies. Uh, have interesting stories. Now here, S. Allen Taylor is well known. He was, uh, you know, we say fakes, forgeries, fantasies. Um, S. Allen Taylor was all of the above. <laughs> yes, please. But what we've really focused on here are his fantasies um, in this exhibit. And one of them, particularly interesting, uh, another way that, that our friend George Hussey um, made a mistake was S. Allen Taylor created these Wine and City Post fantasies and with this, this sort of bomb in the middle that's sometimes described in the literature as being a Crimean War hand grenade. They're really very lovely stamps, very pretty colors, very attractive. Here's a bomb with wings and the wine and city post and two cents. And this was a fantasy that S. Allen Taylor created. But if we go back to Hussey, there it is too. You see, when these, some of these fant what happened with some of these forgers is even when the fantasies appeared on the market, the forgers didn't know that they weren't real or that they were fantasies, and they dutifully forged them uh, because they figured that the collectors would want them. Uh, S. Allen Taylor's uh, fantasies are, he, he was heavily into Confederate fantasies. Here you see the Bucks Richmond Express. Probably his most famous Confederate fantasy are the blockade run uh, postage stamps uh, that are. Uh, were never issued or are totally bogus, never existed. But they're very lovely. They look very convincing, made up with real printers, um, uh, 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 printers type of the period, and these attractive Savannah cancels. 
So he also, in addition to the Confederate stuff, I mean, oh, there's a, uh, a Pleasant Shade, Virginia uh, provisional. He also liked to do Western things. So Utah and Murr's Express in Utah uh, and that sort of thing. And because these Confederates and Western Expresses were new even at the time these fantasies were being created, not a lot was known about them. And so when they would surface on the market, people just thought, ah, here's another one that, that we didn't know about. And a number of these things were listed. Um, in the Scott catalogs and in other catalogs for many, many years. Some of them didn't come out of the catalogs into the 20th century. Um, so, uh, so some of these fantasies had really, uh, really long lives, long-ranging implications. Um, but two, I want to call your attention to in particular, really three, uh, because one of the other things that Taylor often did in his fantasies was poke fun at himself and other philatelists. And so the Little Wanderer's Aid Society, is often uh, thought, uh, talked about in the literature, that the vignette is actually Taylor himself as a young child. It's based on a, on a photograph of himself as a child. And the Cares City Post is uh, from people who knew S. Allen Taylor back when he was active, say it's a very good likeness of him um, in the vignette of this particular stand. This one here, <laughs> the Brown City Post, uh, is a kind of a spoof on William P. Brown, who was an early stamp dealer in New York. And you see him here pushing a wheelbarrow. And in reminiscences of early stamp uh, collecting and dealing in New York City, uh, people said that this was actually how Brown started in City Hall Park. Across from City Hall, uh, he kept pushed his wares around City Hall Park in a wheelbarrow and dealt literally from the vest pocket in the wheelbarrow. Um, and so uh, uh, Taylor does this fantasy stamp showing William P. Brown pushing his stamps in the wheelbarrow, Brown Stamp Depot, 145 Nassau Street. Uh, which, is, which is where Brown uh, uh, worked in the 1870s. And you can see 1877, the year Brown started dealing stamps. Three limps to the post office is the denomination of the stamp. And you see the devil behind William P. Brown, <coughs> his, his horns and his pointy tail, and he's got his hand on William P. Brown's shoulder. A lot of stuff like this, S. Allen Taylor did, as I say, poking fun at himself and other philatelists who he knew. Um, so that's the sort of material um, that, that, and all of that will, see, just about everything that you've seen there, is in four pull-out frames of the William H. Gross stamp gallery. And so when you think about more than 400 of them in that particular room, uh, you take that and what you've just seen and multiply it by about 100, and you've got a sense of the scale of the, of the type of material and the quantity of material uh, from this early period of U.S. philately that will be on view in the, in the, in the Gross gallery. So the, the uh, Projected opening date, as I said in the beginning, is September of this year. And uh, so starting in, starting in fall, you'll be able to come and see the gallery. Uh, here's my contact <coughs> information. I also have uh, cards for anybody who wants them. Uh, if you have questions about material that's in the museum collection, if you have questions about this presentation or just something you want to ask about the museum, even if it's not related at all to this presentation, I'll be happy to do that in, in whatever time I have left. I don't, I don't know what time I have left. Somebody will tell me. Got lots of time. <laughs> oh, I got lots of time. Okay. okay. If you must run for an hour. <laughs> I don't have to. I don't. Feel, it's no religious <laughs> compunction. <laughs> yeah, David. You can find much of this on eBay. Yes. Some of it honest mistakes, mm -hmm. and, but there is a major fantasy maker now. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Who is doing oh. them? A lot of uh, doesn't a lot of Hawaiian special delivery and and things like that. Oh, really? Yeah. And uh, he was he was caught up, and it initially wasn't clear that these were fantasies, but he's cleaned up his act. And the other person that's interesting is a guy over in Latvia, who is doing, uh, I guess you'd call them philatelic forgeries, uh, beautifully done on the front. Uh, I've picked up a few for people that I know are collecting the series of stamps. Uh, started out with U.S., but now he's doing worldwide. Uh, classic material. He doesn't the, mark them. Or, hmm? He doesn't mark them in any way or anything. On the uh, site, uh, when he posts, say copy or something on the back. But when they arrive, some of them are marked on the back. Most of them are not. <laughs> um, like I say, I bought a few for people who are collecting particular things uh, to get them for them to go in their exhibits because, there, because yeah, judges, example. if there's a forgery available, judges like to see it in your right. your exhibit. And I gave Mercer a bunch of them. 
uh, so that he will have you know, reference copies of the type of thing that will come. But when you turn them over, they're on bright white paper, and there's just no doubt that they are what they are. But uh, like I say, the image on the front is beautiful. But it's the interesting double lives of a lot of these pieces, which is that, you know, on one hand, yes, they're fakes and forgeries, and people seek to studiously avoid them, okay. But on the other hand, a number of them become collector's items in their own right. Yeah. And some of the, I mean, some of the really well done, like the European fakes and forgeries from the 19th century, some of those are more valuable and, and cost more than the actual stamp. Yeah. Yeah, anybody who's yeah. doing a thematic on baseball and doesn't have one of those fake uh, birthday covers. Sure. Yeah. Sure. One of, the, one of the real ones, you know, 50 mm -hmm. cents. One of the fake ones, 50 bucks. Yeah. You know, that sort of a thing. Yeah. It's and a lot of a lot of people collect this variety forgeries just to collect oh, yeah. them yeah. as variety forgeries. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Some really great forgers like Sparati, like Fournier, and a couple of others, um, have Spiro being another. They, they are people that, who collect them in their own right as fakes and forgers. Yeah. Yeah. And some of the forgeries are quite well done. I forget what the denomination was, but on the Suez Canal stamps, uh, the forger got one of the original stones. Mm. It was fine when he was doing that denomination, but he the lithograph stone. But then he changed the denominations, and each one of the denominations, since it was a hand done stone, has minor variations. And it was a long time that they didn't catch his because they all looked general, uh, genuine. They were done real lithographs. But then people they noticed that the you know, things like the smoke. Uh, or the way the way the sails were waving, and the number of people who were standing on the deck, and things like this for each one. But those those weren't caught for a long time. One of these guys, I think it was S. Allen Taylor. One of his very earliest fantasies was Egypt, uh, and it shows the pyramids, and the denomination is three asps, is the denomination, and it's incredibly rare. Yeah. Um, and and when one turns up, I mean, it's 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 not cheap, but for your Egypt collection. I'm pretty sure it's S. Allen Taylor um, who created the three S forgery of Egypt right. or not sure, see of Egypt. Some, some of the forgeries, given the printing process on the first uh, Sphinx and Pyramid issue, if the, if the printing is too clean, it's likely to be the forgery. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The printing on the issue was the, the genuine, was not real good. Right, yeah, it's, it's one or the other. Either the forgeries are really, really crude or they look better than the actual stamps, which is which is often in itself a giveaway. Yeah. But to, today, with the digital technology and everything, it's it's uh, like overprints and surcharges. You really yeah. have to be careful with yeah. because those are produced, you know, all the time. Sure. Sure. And the technology is not that's needed to do it is not high end or expensive. Exactly. So very cheaply, you can take some cheap stamps and and, and make them valuable. Questions about the museum or the Gross Gallery or the exhibit or doesn't have to be about this. Just any question you want to ask about the Postal Museum is fine too. S. S. Allen Taylor. Oh yeah. Didn't he also uh, create some um, labels for the Finians that were later reproduced as on the first Irish Republic? May have. States? I've never run across those, but he may have. I thought I thought it was Allen Taylor that. that it yeah. Wouldn't shock me. I was just wondering if they were also in your collection. Well, I mean, as you can see from, um, I mean, the quality is really good. <laughs> the quality of the S. Allen Taylor stuff is, is. And he was prolific. Yes, he was. And it's some of his stuff um, that was listed in the catalogs <laughs> for many years because mm -hmm. it looks so good and looks looks so convincing. Uh, the the money that Gross donated were there were there conditions on that or just I mean did he have certain things that he wanted done or not done or the only thing really that uh, that uh, he said was that he wanted when people left the, the gallery he wanted particularly children to be able to leave the gallery with stamps uh -huh. um, and so and we've been able to accommodate that into the um, Know, into the design of the gallery. And there is going to be a section um, in a gallery called Connecting with U.S. Stamps 
where everybody, not just children, but everybody who comes to the gallery will be able to leave with leave the gallery with a starter collection of you know six or eight stamps and a and a little stock card, so that by the time they've left the gallery, they've they've started their collection. Um, but other than that, uh, no. Uh, all of the selection of objects, the um, uh, sort of the, the, the programming of the themes uh, in each gallery and all that, that was all done by the museum staff and, and, and the curators. Um, and uh, shown to Mr. Gross at various points along the way. And, you know, shown to him, but, uh, but uh, no, it's not like, uh, it's not like he uh, picked out, said, you know, you, you will show this in this area. That he just, no, not at all. Um, and, and of course, the other thing that he did was select three objects from his own collection um, to loan to us uh, uh, to put on display in the gallery. So the block of four inverted Jennies, his um, Pony Express cover, which is one of only two known from the uh, the interrupted mail when the uh, in 1860 when uh, during the Indian Wars in the West, and the um, earliest known use of a U.S. 1847, which is the day after. Uh, the first day of issue, which was July 1st, 1847, and he's got the July 2nd, 1847. Is that the cover. Ten cent? It's the 10 cent. Two, two 10 cents on the cover. Um, so he loaned those three items to us to show in the gallery. Um, but outside of that, as I say, all, all the selecting of objects, writing of the script, and all that was all done by the curators. Other questions? Yeah? Uh, what percentage of the Exhibits are foreign? Um, there's a whole gallery that's called the International Gallery, um, which is entirely foreign. Uh, so one of those six galleries is completely foreign material. Um, then there's another gallery called um, Mail Marks History. And this is really uh, what we would call a, a postal history exhibit. So this is mail transportation, modes and methods of transportation, basically from <laughs> antiquity to the present. Um, and there's a lot of foreign material in that section, although it's not exclusively a foreign gallery. And then the first gallery that collectors come into, which is called World of Stamps, um, is mostly U.S. material, but a large section on the penny black and the origin of stamps, and also then the first uh, s uh, seven or eight countries to issue stamps are featured in that gallery. So there's Switzerland and Brazil and that sort of material. So there's one gallery that's entirely foreign. And then two of the, of the other galleries spread throughout the Gross Gallery have a fairly high percentage of, of foreign <coughs> content in them. Other areas like the GEMS, um, the Gross, or the National Stamp Salon, and the Connect with US Stamps are exclusively US. And do things rotate in and out of those areas? Um, yes and no. So there are parts of the gallery that have been designed to rotate, and then there are parts of the gallery that are that really have been kind of engineered from a, a conservation standpoint to be able to be on display for for thirty years. Um, so so there are uh, in the international gallery um, selections from the specialized collections that will be on view. That's been designed with a view towards rotating. Uh, but then in the same uh, gallery, there's what we call treasures of the world which is a hand-selected grouping of 40, 45 or so of the best foreign individual items from the museum's collection, and that's meant to be permanent. That, that should be there for, for 20 or 30 years. So, so yeah, it's part permanent and partly designed um, for changing exhibits. I've sort of lost track. What, what, what's ever happened with the Miller Collection? Is that still in New York? Or? The Miller Collection is still owned by the New York Public Library, but after it came off view, you know, we had it on view in our gallery on loan for several years. Um, uh, after it came off view, the library decided to place the collection on a long-term loan to us. So they still own it, but it's still physically housed at the Postal Museum in our vault. Okay. Okay. And, and, uh, is, that a large, on, is that on display also? Or? Not at the moment, okay. but it will be in the Gross Gallery. Okay. But right now, if you were to hop on the plane to Washington today and go see it, it's not. It was for about three years. We had the Miller Collection. That was just supposed to be a temporary exhibit, and then it was going to go back to the to the New York Public Library. But I think the New York Public Library saw what reaction there was to it in the philatelic world and how excited people got about it, um, and decided that that although they still own the collection, that we could kind of do more for it than they could in terms of having a gallery and being able to place it on display. So it's on loan to us. 
but uh, what we call a long-term loan, 20, 30 year loan. The both, it's the same, we have the same arrangement with the Postmaster General's collection too. The Postal Service still owns that, but they've placed it on long-term loan with us. Which the advantage to us for that means that we can, we can draw on these things um, in order to use them in our exhibits and display, and the advantage to you is you get to see them. <laughs> I mean, that's, yeah. All of these collections are so massive that they can't all be on view all the time, but, but we can keep changing what we show from them, and that's good too, because it gives people a reason to come back. I mean, if you, don't, if you have everything that's permanent, well, you come and see it once, uh, 30, you don't need to come and see it for 30 years, right? <laughs> so designing sections in the gallery to change gives people a reason to come back to it. Yeah. What uh, percentage of your 4.9 million objects are in Arago? Oh, um, 5.9 million. And uh, I, I probably less than 1%. Really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah long way to go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the general trend, or the, you know, it's, digitization is great. And we have all these seminars and talk about digitization projects and this and that. But it's incredibly labor intensive. Um, and to do it right, it's, it's incredibly expensive too. Um, and so really, um, things get on Arago right now in two ways. Um, one is they're on exhibit in the gallery. And so we do make an effort Anytime anything's on exhibit in the gallery and it's been conserved and scanned and rescanned and all that, then we get it out onto Arago so that everything just about that you see in the gallery, you can see on Arago as well. Um, and then for other things like special projects, like we made an effort at one point to have the complete U.S. collection online uh, so that people could go in and, and see the entire U.S. collection. Um, we also have a complete Vatican collection online. So things are digitized for special projects like that. And then other things, um, you know, as, as resources and, and, and uh, other, other constrictions permit. But um, it's, digitization takes a long time and it's very labor intensive. Um, so it's 1% of 6 million is what, 60,000, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would you say that's right? Fewer than six, mm -hmm. maybe fewer than sixty thousand things on Iran. Probably, maybe two percent. If I'm being <laughs> optimistic, uh, I like one percent. Yeah, I think so. And that's maybe taking years. Good. That's taking years. And part of the thing with digitization also is always that the technology is changing. And so Arago was state of the art six, seven years ago when it debuted at the Washington 2006 show. It is not anymore. Um, and if you pull out your iPad or your iPhone or whatever, you can't look at Arago one because Arago was built around flesh, um, which doesn't work on the new iPhones and iPads. Um, and so we're going to have to re So it's not just you digitize it once, you put it online, and it's done. You've got to keep up with the constantly changing technology, too. So it's, it, it, it will take many, many years. Yeah. Okay, it's job security. <laughs> Any other questions? Or? Okay, well, thanks for coming. Go back to the show. Start looking for that space and <laughs>